So we have Dr. Uh, Naomi Quintanar uh, joining us from Arizona. She's a licensed naturopathic physician and medical director of Pristine Naturopathic Medicine in Tuscan, Arizona. She is a thyroid cancer survivor and through her experience with thyroid issues because of her own um, thyroid disorder, she gained a lot of experience and knowledge about thyroid function and related disorders. And in her practice now, she is sharing all the knowledge she has she has gained over the past few years to the individuals who need help with thyroid function. Her focus area is thyroid dysfunction. And today she'll be sharing her insights on thyroid's role in infertility. Uh, she'll be sharing her case studies to show how uh, the thyroid plays a very important role in infertility. Dr. Naomi, a very warm welcome. I'm so excited to have you here and really looking forward uh, to your insights and what all you have to share with us. Over to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your introduction. Um, um, I need to move this from my... So I will be speaking on how the role of thyroid with um, the reproductive system, how that affects women, a large number of women, and they seek other forms of treatment, which oftentimes uh, don't work, and they're uh, and they feel very um, depressed, which adds on to their other symptoms, and so therefore. Um, many of them end up in my office with this complaint. I would add on to Dr. Priti's introduction about the <clears throat> frequency of thyroid issues in the general population. And I have a few points that we need to keep in mind because we do forget that thyroid does do a lot more than just having to do with our weight, our metabolism, our... <clears throat> hair loss, those things that we see, but we forget that deeper underneath the skin, thyroid can actually, it is uh, functioning in every cell in our body. So I don't know if you can see the PowerPoint because I see my, let's see, let me move this out of the way. Um, <clears throat> So as, as um, it was mentioned, I have been in practice for several years. And my first, when I started practicing, I did not focus on thyroid like I do now. I was going through my own journey with thyroid. And as a cancer survivor from thyroid cancer, the effects of that <clears throat> have, have really changed my life completely. And as I started working with patients. Patients um, taught me many lessons about thyroid. And now I am able to help them with my own experience and where they can um, gain their health again once their thyroid is balanced. So a few things that, uh, let's see. I seem to get my... I uh, can't seem to get my slides to. Okay, I can't move my slides forward. Uh, I'll share it for you. Are you able to share your screen, doctor? Mm, I should be. Hold on a second. If not, I'll help you. I'll share your screen. Oh, just let me just, okay. I don't want to close my. Uh, yeah, it's supposed to share right now. Okay. Yeah. Is this 
Okay, so I can't see. Okay, it doesn't move. I will share my, I, I'll share it for you. Okay, so the next slide will show some of the important things that I tell my patients concerning thyroid. And this is the importance, the, the important for them to know that why they're feeling the way they're feeling. Thyroid hormone directs the neurological development conception. And that's huge when a woman is going to become pregnant. Because if their thyroid is low, they will have neurological, the infant will have a neurological deficits, but they will also have complications during preg pregnancy. And many times, one of the, uh, these complications can be very devastating. The main one is miscarriage during the first trimester. If they're able to go through the pregnancy, a lot of times they will develop eclampsia. And this is devastating at the low, uh, towards the end of the pregnancy for both mother and child. So it is important to remember that thyroid hormone does direct the neurological development at conception. Mother, the, the pregnant woman will supply the T4 and T3 that's required for this to happen. And it's interesting that the mother's thyroid will double in size to provide enough thyroid hormone for herself and for the infant. And during this time, it is crucial to keep those levels elevated for the development of the, of the infant so that the pregnancy can be viable to also to keep the pregnancy for the full term. If the mother is not treated for their thyroid issue or they're undertreated, they will still they will have consequences of that during their pregnancy. If the if the pregnancy does go to full term and they have not been treated, they, they do run a risk of having a child with autism on somewhere on the spectrum. And they will have uh, also some neurological deficits, not necessarily physical, but they may have sensory issues. They may have texture issues. They may have be sensitive in other ways like touch okay, and so this creates it. a problem for okay I'll send it as their again. child is having um Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> issues with clothing issues with food and so it that's part of this uh neurological deficit that can occur if the mother is not treated properly when they are pregnant Low thyroid function, hypothyroidism, has 300 symptoms associated with it, which can lead to 59 chronic, debil chronic debilitating diseases. <clears throat> In that chronic debilitating diseases, it can double the risk for Alzheimer's later in life, and it can also cause a hypothyroid-induced dementia, not necessarily Alzheimer's, but beginnings of dementia. And I'm going to pause here to speak of one of my patients. It's not on the case in, in written up. Two months ago, someone uh, <clears throat> made an appointment for this elderly lady. And when the history is this person was on thyroid medication, the doctor said this patient is um, in her late 80s. And the patient said, I mean, the doctor told the patient, your thyroid is normal. The lab work is normal. You don't need thyroid medication anymore. So he took her off the medication. Six months later, she developed dementia. That's when the caregiver brought her, her friend to me. So I ran the test for thyroid, and it turns out not only is she hypothyroid, she has Hashimoto's. She has both antibodies, the, the thyroid peroxidase antibody and the thyroglobulin, which was enhancing or making her dementia worse. If we go by blood work, we will miss, diagnose and mistreat individuals. This lady did not have dementia prior to six months ago. And that's a mistake because when individuals are taking medication, their lab results will change and they will look normal. And that doesn't mean that the thyroid is normal. It's, it's normalized due to the medication they're on. Thyroid 
function does not last a lifetime. It's not sustainable. Humans used to live around what, 50, 60 years old in the past. Now we are living into the 80s, 90s, and even into the hundreds. I see a lot of women, especially around menopause. And not only are there um, Hormones are unbalanced, their thyroid is unbalanced, and that's where I see the majority of people, of women, having thyroid issues. Because when the hormones dysregulate and the thyroid cannot be part of that picture, they get their, their symptoms are often worse. In the United States, we have a high rate of thyroid problems. There's 59, chron there's 59 million people with thyroid issues. It's an estimated number. Not even a third have been diagnosed, much less treated properly. The test that is used in the United States is only 18% accurate, and everybody <clears throat> seems to fall in the normal when they're not in the normal because they have one of or more of the 300 symptoms that are associated with low thyroid function. So many elderly need to be on thyroid medication just to keep their mind healthy and themselves healthy. And the latest studies that I've read of concerning that is, it is now thought that it's not, it is necessary to treat individuals in starting in their 60s and 70s with thyroid to maintain their thyroid function, especially now that the general population is living longer years than before. Worldwide, 200 million people have thyroid issues. This does not include children. So these are 200 million adults with thyroid problems. That means that every country on this world has thyroid issues. Doctors are missing it because they mimic other chronic debilitating diseases that fall under thyroid. And that's a lot of people. And I don't think with all the functional medicine physicians out there, out in every country, I don't think we can reach these 200 million people, but we'll try. Another aspect of the thyroid is children do have thyroid issues. They have thyroid dysfunction. When a mother tells me, I have a, my baby never cried as an if when they were born. She, my baby was newborn, never cried, slept through the night. I look at them and say, your child has a thyroid problem. Newborns, are hungry, they'll cry two or three times a night. They'll cry during the day. And when you have a mother tell you, my child who's now two years old doesn't cry. It's a perfect baby, doesn't bother me. It's constipated, but always sleeping. That's a thyroid issue. That's congenital hypothyroidism. And the reason I'm bringing this up, and even though the topics is on, on fertility, is because the children will grow to be adults. And if they're hypothyroid now in a young age, they'll be hypothyroid when they're adults. When they go into puberty, that's when it's going to show. When they want to have family, it's going to show that their, their ability to be able to get pregnant is not as easy as, as it should be. So <clears throat> this is long range. It starts with adults, but then if the mother or father or both or someone in the family has thyroid issues, it's very likely that it's also in the next generation. So we need to remember that. There are children that are born with smaller thyroids <clears throat> in size. A small thyroid cannot produce enough thyroid hormone for their development. So it's necessary to supplement. And I'll stop here to say another case study. My youngest patient with thyroid issues came to see me or her mother brought me, brought her daughter to see me, and she was 14 months old. Her history was, <clears throat> since she was born, she slept right 12 hours at night, took naps in the day, two, two naps, four hours uh, a nap. She had to physically wake her up. She was constantly constipated. She was a picky eater. She did not cry. <clears throat> and you can sit her anywhere. <clears throat> excuse me, and she would not move. She wouldn't even call attention to herself. When I put her on thyroid and 
uh, prior to putting her on thyroid medication, um, on the growth charts, she was below 10%, and some of the values were below the line of below zero. She wasn't growing, she wasn't gaining weight, her head circumference was smaller, and in, and her pediatrician said, oh, don't worry, she'll grow out of it. I said, she won't grow out of it. She needs thyroid medication. Within two months on thyroid medication, the following the follow-up, this little, this little girl came in running. She hugged everybody. She was talking. She grew two inches. She gained two pounds. She grew an inch in her head circumference. The, the mother was ecstatic. Her child, she woke up her child. The mother has of um, Hashimoto's, and she knew her, her child had thyroid issues just because she could see her symptoms in her daughter. The pediatrician said she's normal. And the, and the child now is eight years old, was labeled failure to thrive. Now she's mainstream in school, and she's doing well. She's social. She's active. She has these sociable, she communicates. <clears throat> if this child had not been treated, and as they get older, they would be more hypothyroid and more hypothyroid during puberty, she would have horrendous periods, menses, she would have trouble learning. And so now the next generation, like from her, her when once she's an adult, knowing that she has thyroid issues, we know that if we keep treating her correctly, her offspring may not have hypothyroid issues because it is hereditary. And yes, there is some genetic component, but if the mother is low, the child will be born low in thyroid function. And it's not very common to have a child born without a thyroid, but I've had a few this with individuals who were born with an inactive thyroid, and <clears throat> they were hypothyroid since birth. Most of the individuals that I treat are come to see me uh, are in their menopausal time in their 40s, and that's when I discover they have had thyroid issues. I've had people come in already with thyroid issues or with the symptoms of thyroid that have been um, that I diagnose. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so thyroid is a puzzle because we don't get all the symptoms in order. With 300 symptoms, any individual can present with one or two symptoms or a variety of symptoms, and none of the symptoms make... Um, a diagnosis, but, but there's there's no reason, there's no logical reason why they feel this way because they don't can't find what caused their symptoms. Infertility is more common in women. Men can also have problems with fertility if they have a low thyroid. So it's across the board. Both men and women will have the same problem. Thyroid dysfunction, nutritional deficiencies, uh, mineral deficiencies, lifestyles, not sleeping, working, uh, stress, all of these affect the um, fertility. Thyroid hormones like estrogen and progesterone can lead to dysfunctional um, cycles, but they're managed by the thyroid. And they also can lead to infertility. It's <clears throat> because these hormones need to be at a certain balance and ratio, and the thyroid hormone also, if they're off, they uh, the woman will start be having uh, menses problems, whether they're scanty, irregular, um, heavy, one month skip two months, maybe not have a cycle, and so on and so forth. And if they do happen to, to conceive, if their thyroid is still low, they will have a miscarriage. 
So, <clears throat> so when these individuals present in your office, it is important to take a detailed history. <clears throat> detailed history of when they started menses, what symptoms they had then, <clears throat> if any changes throughout the years, what difficulties they had with becoming pregnant, if there's a family history of thyroid, and what kind of thyroid they may be, if they may have, <clears throat> and if they have, if these individuals are on medication. This helps you determine how to approach and how, <clears throat> what to give the individual in order to reverse their, their um, infertility. So this, <clears throat> So we're going to, let's see, what might be the pages. Okay, so the next page. Um, to figure out this puzzle, if you go to the next slide, please. Family history is important. Now, besides blood work, I use the Thyroflex extensively because I find that that blood um, lab tests are not often accurate to determine uh, someone with a low thyroid. I found the thyroflex to be very reliable and has been very effective in balancing the thyroid to where the patients can have a, a better quality of life. Thyroflex does not help you diagnose autoimmune. But there's a there's a red flag when you do a thyroflex. <clears throat> if their symptom survey is uh, their hypo symptoms are very high, uh, um, somewhere in between 40, 50, 60 points, and they may have some hyper symptoms that are present, and the reflex is normal, that's when I suspect an autoimmune thyroid disorder. And everyone that I have done this always comes back with thyroid antibodies. Uh, <clears throat> the autoimmune thyroid disorders here in the United States is often not treated. Endocrinologists and other doctors, they tell the patients you have an autoimmune thyroid disorder and they'll say, <clears throat> "It's a don't worry about it. You have thyroid antibodies, it's fine, but you're hypothyroid. Well, they are. Autoimmune thyroid disorders, Hashimoto's and Graves, will, will lead to hypothyroidism. The problem with the autoimmune thyroid disorders, it, it does destroy the thyroid gland. If, if the, the TPO antibody will just bind to the, T, to the thyroid peroxidase enzyme that places the iodine onto the structure, and it makes it inactive. So... <clears throat> When the TPO antibody is elevated, the thyroid cannot produce enough thyroid hormone to meet that per the person's demands, what their body needs to function optimally. <clears throat> Graves, uh, when you have thyroglobulin antibody, that destroys the cells that make thyroid hormone by binding to the membrane, <clears throat> the thyroglobulin membrane of the cell, bursts its open, releases all that, that hormone. That's why they have spikes. That's why they have excess T4, excess T3, and they feel jittery and they feel like their heart's going to burst. They have a lot of um, major palpitations and, and anxiety-like symptoms. Those cells that are lysed open, are we can no longer repair them. They're gone. So the higher the, the thyroglobulin is or, the, or however long the person has it in their system, they, the thyroid starts losing the, the ability to make thyroid hormone because there's not enough cells to produce hormone to meet their body's demand of thyroid hormone. And this is why when a woman has uh, one of these autoimmune thyroid disorders, it's very difficult for them to get pregnant. And, it, and it's really more difficult for them, them to be able to go to full term. So they'll miscarry in the first trimester. <clears throat> okay, and now we'll go to the next page. 
And this is a case that's very interesting. This is a very 38-year-old uh, female who came to see me after having IVF treatments, interview fertilization treatments. She did three rounds over a course of a couple, uh, several years. And each one, each time she had, she did a treatment, she did become, she could conceive, but six weeks later, she will lose the baby. My question to her is, does anyone in your family have thyroid problems? And there was a history. I did the Thyroflex, her reflex was 195. Then I did a full panel of her hormones, her thy the thyroid panel and everything else. The reason is she was having problems with her cycle after the treatment. So I have on the next page her labs because I want to show you. So she came to see me uh, in June. June 19th was her first lab. She was a little bit deficient in her iron, so I put her in iron. She, her, her testosterone level was higher than it is should be for women. So I suspected PCOS because PCOS is, is related to dysfunction of thyroid hormone. A1C was okay. So where I was looking for any uh, hint, any suggestion of diabetes, especially since she wanted to be pregnant, we wanted to avoid gestational diabetes during pregnancy. Her estrogen was very low during the ovulatory phase. So, and her progesterone was also low during that phase. So I have here the levels of that, that the range of Estrone was high and ferritin was low, meaning her iron stores were very low. And iron is very important in thyroid function, and it's needed to be more in the, in the range. Her TSH was still normal, but low normal. Her T4 was also low. But because it's in the range, most people think most people think they're normal. Well, the ranges include people that are sick. They include people that are hyper, and they include people that are hypo. So it's not an, act, an, an actual true value of what your body needs. So everybody's body, everybody's thyroid feeds that body to the levels of hormone that that body needs, and it's not the same for all of us. On the next page, we're going to continue with 619. On the next page, we see the T, no thyroid antibodies present. Her DHA is also is within normal. Her vitamin D is low. And then her estradiol, estriol is low. If we go back to the, next, to the previous page, please. We see uh, October 10th, her iron went high up increased or testosterone increased. Um, A1C just went by, uh, up a tenth of a point, but we see that our hormones are getting into a normal level. So T4 is still low. It's lower now. And then it's lower because, pe because it is being converted to free, T to free T3 for both her and the baby. In this case, she became pregnant and this time. So we go to the next page. The next, uh, the next page will see that her DHA increased, her vitamin D is, is, is better. It's a little on the high side, but we notice that her human chorionic gonadotropin has increased. At this time, she was four weeks pregnant. And now we see the estriol coming up. Estriol is high during pregnancy. At, what I did for this patient is the treatment was, which would be on the next page. I started her prior to the pregnancy. I started her on thyroid medication. I used desiccate, natural desiccated thyroid hormone. 
I started her on a progesterone cream to bring her progesterone up. I have put her on a fertility protocol using specialized herbs for regulating ovulation and also improving the health, uh, the tissue in the uterus for implantation. And I put both her and her husband on this protocol. There's products for men and products for women. Her husband was also hypothyroid and it ran in his family. He was being treated. He was treated for the male for uh, infertility because he also was having issues. He also was in his 30s. So, you know, it, it, it happened to that they both did the protocol and then they, they were able to conceive. She had been on the protocol for about five months when she became pregnant. We stopped all the herbal um, protocol and we had, I had her increase the, the, the progesterone and I referred her out to an OBGYN. As, um, so she still, she has about two more weeks to go. Her, her baby is due in May. So, um, <clears throat> And I don't expect my patients to get to conceive that quickly, but they do once the thyroid hormone gets to a certain level and once the hormones start to increase to be able to um, conceive. JM did not have problems conceiving. She had problems keeping the pregnancy going. And that was because when the, she was using the doing the IVF, treatments, they weren't giving her high enough progesterone to keep the environment to keep the to keep the pregnancy safe. So we're waiting to see when our baby's born. So this is one case and this is a one more recent one. Um so it doesn't take much to to get them to conceive. Now we have to once the thyroid has been um, balanced because it seems like our body knows what to do when we give it what it needs. When we give the proper dose of thyroid medication, we definitely get the results that we're looking. In this case, her thyroid medication had to be increased because in the first trimester, she, the T4 and T3 need to be on the upper end of the range in order for the, the first trimester where the, the, the fetus is developing to give it the hormones that it needs. Remember, thyroid hormone, and that, that means T4 and T3, regulate the development, the neurological development of conception. And at conception, T4 and T3 need to be high. That's why they need to be treated prior to conceiving to get those levels. If they're low, they need the higher levels so that when they do conceive, their thyroid knows what to do. It will double in size, produce more thyroid hormone, and they can have a normal pregnancy. So we have, um, let's see, okay, next, next slide. So these are the things, these are the symptoms or um, signs that individual uh, women will, will notice when uh, their thyroid is off. Irregular menstrual cycles. Either they're spaced out or they're frequent or they're heavy or they have scanty. It's, it's just a mix of things. They're not able to ovulate. Body temperature is very important for that. And if thyroid, thyroid regulates our basal body temperature, most individuals with thyroid uh, issues, their temperature is somewhere around 96, 97 uh, Fahrenheit, I, think, I don't know what it is in uh, Celsius, but it should be higher because at 98.6 where the normal body temperature should be, that's when ovulation occurs. Polycystic ovary syndrome is a thyroid problem. They have high levels of TSH, they have low levels of progesterone, they have elevated testosterone, irregular cycles, they have cysts on the ovaries or and the cyst on the ovaries is actually the ovum coming to the surface but not being able to to 
burst because of progesterone and is not there and the thyroid hormone to allow the, the ovum to be released. Estrogen is there, but estrogen, the elevated testosterone is coming from the tissue of the cyst. So they have excess testosterone that's creating an imbalance with higher levels of estrogen, estradiol compared to the progesterone. If they're stressed, they have stress in their life, whether it's a job, whether it's family, whatever it may be, stress lowers your progesterone because stress converts, because progesterone converts to cortisol. So stress can also be a factor of, of causing di a dysfunction of the cycle because of the way it's, it, it, uh, because the, it draws the progesterone to lower levels. Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Oftentimes, Hashimoto's is seen with po uh, polycystic ovaries. Sometimes, which means there's two factors that are affecting the dysfunction of the thyroid and the inability to become pregnant. All ovarian, uh, low ovarian reserves, that means they don't have enough uh, ovum or they don't, they don't, um, they're not released. And then hyperthyroidism, and it should be hypothyroidism. Hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism, both of these are affect the thyroid and affect your body in many, many ways. Autoimmune thyroid disorders lead to hypothyroidism. Hyperthyroidism in itself without antibodies, there are individuals who are born with an overactive thyroid, that will lead to hypothyroidism. And I believe that many times when women when or even men have Hashimoto's, when they when a, an individual has Hashimoto's and they have thyroid antibodies, I believe that sometimes doctors don't want to treat it because they know in the long run, years from when they're diagnosed, their thyroid is going to burn out and it's easier to treat a hypothyroid individual. The problem is from the time they have the thyroid antibodies to that, it, it could be 10, 20 years, they will be suffering multiple of these 300 symptoms that are re related to thyroid dysfunction. And that's, and infertility is rampant. It's everywhere. Every country has problems with infertility. Women are having issues. And this is why um, it's necessary to treat individuals first, find out if they have a thyroid problem, if it's thyroid, treat them. If it's not thyroid, go to the next, next diagnosis. Rule out thyroid first because you're going to find that, that that may be just the one thing that needs to be balanced, that everything else starts to function better. The next slide will show other, dis, other um, symptoms or conditions that happen with thyroid dysfunction. Low basal body temperature. Our body temperature should be around what 37 Celsius. If it's lower than that, women cannot ovulate properly. If if it's lower than that, our metabolism is slow. Because at, at 37 Celsius, reactions occur in our body. So if you remember those of those of us that took chemistry and we had to make a substance and we had a beaker with a solution and we put a, a Bunsen burner underneath it, we had to get the right temperature to get the product. If it was too high, we wouldn't get much. If it was too low, it would take forever or never get the product. Our body's the same way. Our body temperature should be at 37 consistently. That's when our metabolism works. That's when all the pathways go and, and we end it, get the end product like our energy, our muscle tone, our skin, our hair, our GI function, because one of the problems with thyroid dysfunction is constipation. Constipation because there's not enough thyroid hormone in the cells to create motility. The peristalsis of the, of, the, of the GI tract, the intestines is slow, and sometimes it's so slow, some people don't have a bowel movement for two, three weeks, even in a month. And I've had patients like that and they tell me they're normal. 
um, which is quite interesting. But it's normal for them because they never know before that 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 it wasn't. Graves' disease causes hyperthyroid symptoms. These are the opposite of hypo. For instance, it's palpitations, raising heart rate, um, skipping beats of the heart. Um, they come and go. Usually at rest, we feel them. We have spontaneous sweating. Sometimes it's, uh, we feel hot. We get an anxious um, anxiety-like symptoms. We feel shaky. We feel like inside our body is like this. We can't stop it. We feel like we need to be moving because otherwise something's going to happen. And it's constant. So one of my patients, a person that came to see me, we did her thyroid antibodies. Her thyroid globulin, globulin antibody was greater than 2000. She was like this. You could feel it. If you touch her, you could feel her body vibrate. That's a lot of hormone. Her thyroid was being attacked so severely that eventually it will just burn out. Thyroid antibodies, uh, thyroid globulin antibodies destroy the thyroid cells. Those cells can never, cannot be restored. So there are individuals with Hashimoto's that have both antibodies. One is destroying the enzyme, the other is destroying the cells. So they cycle like this. So sometimes they have a, a surge and then they bottom out. They, they feel the energy, but they're exhausted. And when that combination, it makes it very hard for women to become pregnant. So this is a, these, um, so this, these, um, I don't know how to increase the volume, so I, I, I apologize for that. I'll try to speak louder. So once these cells are destroyed, the, that person becomes hypothyroid. And the more destruction is hypothyroidism. Um, okay, and we'll go to the next page, please. So these two hormones are regulated by thyroid. They feed each other. Estradiol and progesterone have a role in infertility. The levels are, that's why we cycle, women cycle. It's, uh, when we don't have a cycle, they tend to be lower. They climb, we have, we prepare the environment for conception and implantation. If that doesn't occur, we have a cycle. And it's regulated by the thyroid. Levels of estradiol can also influence thyroid function. So if a, a woman has too much estrogen, it will bind the, the hormone by producing or increase the production of thyroid binding globulin. So it takes it out of the picture. It cannot be, um, it cannot be used. And so that decreases our, our metabolism, that causes fat deposits, and that may, and, and we see that in women. We see this around menopause. We see this after an, uh, an individual who is hyperthyroid, we'll see that over the years, them gain the, the weight gain. Progesterone decreases the production of these this uh, thyroid binding globulin, so it has it tends to increase thyroid hormone activity. So there's a balance between these three hormones. They they and the the balance has to be at at the right ratios in order to be able to have optimum function. So the, the if, if we have estrogen dominance, which is a fairly common um, if it's a very common term that we use, estrogen dominance and progesterone deficiency, we will have a hard time conceiving because 
Both of these are needed for ovulation in order to have, in order to conceive for a pregnancy. So um, moving forward to the next page. So how do we diagnose this? What do we do? Talk to your patients, ask them questions, get a detail of everything. Past experience, ask, to ask them how much stress they have. What's their stress? Because stress also dampens our hormones. Do the thyroid testing, do antibodies, even if you don't suspect they may have it. If someone in their family has an autoimmune thyroid disorder, definitely do that. Do a, a complete metabolic panel. You want to know if they're anemic. You want to know if they have uh, a B12 deficiency. You want to know if they're vitamin D level. You want to know their hormone levels. Now there's testing for hormone where you test certain times of the month. If the, if the individual is regular, but having still difficulty conceiving, you want to get the, the, the testing for like for progesterone, um, between day 19 to 21, and then estrogen in the early part of the period of the cycle. For many of my patients, I don't do that because they're so irregular, they don't even know when their last period was. So if someone's last menstrual period was six months ago and they haven't had one and they have spotting here and there, it doesn't matter because they will be low anyway. So all of these, make sure you do a hemoglobin A1C because you do want to see if they're anywhere near being diabetic. This will contribute to gestational diabetes, which is makes the pregnancy harder. So I'm coming to case two. Case two is a very interesting case. Case two, she's a 32 year old female her first appointment was in August. She had not had a, a, a period since, I believe it was, um, I forgot to write it down. So it was in, in like six months before. Well, her, her last period was in August of 23. She came to see me. Um, she just had a period. And she had not had cycles for three years. She had a history she could conceive, but in the first trimester, we'll lose her baby. She had four pregnancies and four miscarriages. She, her stress was that she slept for five hours because she worked 80 hours a week. She had two jobs, two full-time jobs. She had, um, she started her period her cycle in puberty at age nine, they were fine. And then around age 17, they became irregular and she started having symptoms. So cramping, pelvic pain. And, and then she started to notice that her blood, her flow was had a lot of clots. So this was, um, this was uh, her cycle. So she's lost, she miscarried very early in the trimester. In her family, her mother had thyroid issues. Her brother has thyroid issues. And she never really, her thyroid was normal on paper. When I say on paper, her labs tests were normal. But she had constant pelvic pain. She had... Um, Stabbing pain. She worked as a, in, a, in a factory that makes uh, tortillas, and she would package them. It was standing, and then she worked in another place as a. Um, she would clean a clinic. She had many side effects. She had many, many symptoms of thyroid: hair loss, leg cramps. She she would swell. She was tired. She had. Um, mood swings. She was, uh, she had a lot of, a component of depression because she could not conceive. Her thyroid flex speed of, uh, was 209. So I had her start the thyroid, I didn't have her start the thyroid medication or the progesterone cream 
I gave it to her at the initial um, consult, but she was to do her blood work first before we before starting that. In November, she thought she had a urinary tract infection, so she went to the urgent care and the urgent care center to the hospital, to the ER, and she did not have a UTI. She had, she turns out that she had a positive pregnancy test. So on the next slide, we'll see her labs. We only did one lab because this was prior to her finding out she was pregnant. Her TSH was within the normal range. Her progesterone, if you see across, is 10. It's, she has no progesterone. Her um, T3, T4 was normal. Her 3, T3, her reverse T3, this is a culprit. Reverse T3 is very important because reverse T3 mim is the mirror image of free T3. Biologically, I mean, the way um, studies are made, it's not considered to have any biological um, function, but it does in the sense that it will block the, the free T3 receptors on the cells and the, and when we have excess uh, free T4, it will convert to reverse T3. Reverse T3 is a mechanism that our body has to, uh, for us to preserve energy to heal when we have a stressful situation. Like for example, if I fracture my leg, I really shouldn't go and run a marathon. So I, my reverse T3 would be high because I need to slow down to, for healing. When we have chronic stress, in this case, this person had two jobs and didn't sleep. Stressful and she worried about how well she didn't get pregnant. How did this affect her? Her first four pregnancies were with her husband. Because they could not conceive, they filed for a divorce. Not because they didn't like each other or love each other, but there was blame. It was either him or me, I'm not good enough, whatever it was be. It was very interesting. She, They decided to divorce because they could not have a family. That's devastating. And soon after, she she found her she remarried and and um, but when we adjusted her thyroid, we can see that she she conceived like in the last um, slide in November from August to November on thyroid and progesterone cream she actually was able to conceive. It was at that point I told her you need to come in we need to adjust your thyroid medication because we need to get you into the second tri and the second um, se uh, tri uh, semester of pregnancy, we need to have you have a healthy baby. Because you're having complications, I, I told her, you're going to have to take time off of your job because you can lose the baby. So, she had had some um, vaginal bleeding. They found a little pocket of blood outside of the uterus. And I said, it's not worth you work. The, your job can wait. It'll be, always be there. But having a baby, this is your chance. This is not time for you to really consider taking it easy. So she's due in June. So not too far from now, two more months. And so far, she's doing great. So so when we look at her um, labs, we find that her estrogen, her estradiol is low. The luteal phase is, the ovulatory luteal phase is a time where ovulation occurs and that's where implantation should occur. That's also the time if uh, implantation does not occur or no one, a woman doesn't conceive, that's when our menses start. But you can see that she's low on the estradiol. Her progesterone is not existent. This is very interesting because um, 
it is it is one of the reasons she could not remember i i mentioned that progesterone when we're stressed converts to cortisol this is one reason why her progesterone is low not only did she's not making enough and she kind of had a picture of pcos but we weren't able to prove that um is that her stress was very high with 80 hours a, a week of work her body was very stressed so she was able to conceive. I did not expect her to conceive so soon after starting the thyroid and the progesterone because of how she was explaining her pregnancies. The same with uh, JM. I didn't think she was going to get pregnant that soon either because of the IVF treatments. But she told me that they really were very hard on her, on her body. And all I can say is when you give the body what it needs, at the level that it needs it, when it can use it, the body can respond positive. It will give you the results. You will get the results. And your patient will be so grateful to you when you're able to help them with just, in this case, it was only two, the main two things that I did were uh, the thyroid and the progesterone. I run all the blood tests. Um, I had a, I saw a question who what was the Thyroflex? The Thyroflex is a device that's automated to measure a deep tendon relaxation in the middle of the reflex, which is very common in hypothyroid individuals, including individuals with autoimmune. It is 98% more accurate and it gives you a better sense, even when the symptoms are kind of uh, strange, meaning to say it's not always the classic symptoms that we see. With thyroid, you can have a lot of symptoms in any of the 300. You put them together, it doesn't make a diagnosis. But the Thyroflex clears it up for me. My own journey is very different than most people. I had thyroid cancer um, and that thyroid cancer was one of it's less than 5% of the population that get it. It's very rare, but the prognosis is very poor. My prognosis was five years, um, and that was in 1999. So to me, I really, really focus on thyroid because your life can be miserable if your thyroid is not adjusted. And you think it's normal, but it's not. When... And the reason I mentioned the fiber flex is because when I met the, the person that invented the fiber flex, he adjusted my dose, which I thought he was crazy because he adjusted, he tripled my dose. But at that point, I thought I have nothing to lose. So that test saved my life. I had a thyroidectomy. The test for that, for monitoring my thyroid was, or lack of a thyroid, was the TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone. Doesn't make sense to me because I don't have a thyroid. So in conclusion, thyroid can be very complex, but at the same time, it can be very simple because focusing on the symptoms, focusing on the person and hearing their story, doing the proper tests, you can determine a simple treatment to get them to where they're at. When they start feeling better, they realize that what they were been what they had been feeling was not their normal. And that's the beauty about dealing with, with treating people with thyroid. Things tend to normalize and their quality of life improves. Uh, I think my time is up. Yes, Dr. Naomi, and thank you so much 